Hello everyone and welcome back once more to the Lost Wisdom of the Earth Tele Summit. Now today I have as my guest someone who is making a life's work of understanding Earth energies and their implications. Originally trained as a geologist and learning to douse whilst working in the mines of Africa, on his return to the UK he spent over 20 years exploring the mysteries of Earth energy lines and is the first person to classify the different types of lines and offer some understanding of what is generating them. Today he helps people with geobiological problems as well as helping to repair some of the largest nodes around the world in the new earth grid which is being embedded within the old in preparation for what is coming. He is Rory Duff. Rory, welcome. Thank you very much Sarah, I much appreciate that uh, lovely introduction, very kind of you. Well, I, I kind of feel that we've only really scratched the surface, um, as is so often the case in that, that, that brief introduction, because there's all sorts of fascinating stories that lie behind that. So, you know, as a beginning, can I just, I, I know you're going to, you, you've got, a, you know, slides and, and you're going to tell us all about the classification of Earth energy lines and things like this before we, uh, and there's a lot more as well that we can talk about. But could you just give us a very brief background as how how, how you got into this? Because... Um, I think, as I said to you earlier, this is this is not on the school curriculum or careers advice. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it, it was came as a bit of a surprise to me. I was working as a geologist uh, underground um, uh, in in Africa, uh, with, and was, there was a, a team of geologists there, and it was an Italian one called Paolo, and um, we we're often called out for surface problems as opposed to the ones underground, and. Uh, calls from farmers to, to find water for them uh, yeah. was uh, well, it's not a, not a common but we had it a few times and uh, Paolo sort of grabbed me one day and said come Rory we go look for water and I didn't sort of think too much of it because we could just build a build, bring a drill crew out and, and drill a well mm -hmm. for people and um, and yet when he got there he opened up his boot and pulled out some dowsing rods <laughs> which was quite a surprise he says oh we know where the water's here Rory we just don't know exactly where so we use the use the rods for accuracy and and yeah he, it's he was right this limestone and it, the water runs about 30 meters deep where we were and small channels about a foot wide and, and you could take a drill and miss it easily but with you've got the dowsing rods you can you can sight the drill so much more accurately and then hit water and what we did we we always hit water so um yeah so you had a hundred percent accuracy yeah yeah <laughs> It, it was a useful feedback model uh, when it comes to dowsing. You, you need to keep looking for that feedback. So, mm. so that, uh, you're checking that what you're dowsing is actually right. And um, that was important when looking for earth energy lines because uh, you needed to have an, an idea that what you're looking for is, is there. And, of course, it's invisible. So someone else who's, uh, who's looking at the same time can give you feedback or a map of the energy lines that someone else has done can give you feedback. So, yeah, that's... Uh, that's how it sort of began, really. I, when I came back to this country, I was introduced to Earth Energies, uh, reading uh, Hamish Miller's book, The Sun and the Serpent, and uh, thought, yeah, we'll have a look at those and see what I can <laughs> <laughs> And that hooked you in. <laughs> yeah, that not, an, not immediately, though, because um, I was also doing Aikido. It's a, it's a, it's a self-defense martial art, and, and it's not competitive in that sense, but it used key energy uh to do some amazing things and um so i was kind of interested in, in human key in aikido mm -hmm. and then and then the, the the concept that the earth energy lines was like an earth key uh and i began to wonder well what's the connection and um at that point which was back in 98 99 i kind of was thinking it might be connected to gravity yeah mm -hmm. and i started looking at where the energies earth energies were in relation to the geography on the, on the area and I found that these energy lines tended to move from one area of relative high ground to another like uh, you know, Borough Mump, Castanbury yeah. Tor, Brim Tor uh, and, and they would seemingly be where the areas of high ground are and I thought maybe there's a connection with, with gravity which I explored for a while um, but, but have since changed my mind a little bit on that well it definitely changed it it's not it's not gravity um, right okay well <laughs> Let's get into what it is and, and what these lines are, because you you have, and I'm going to show everybody this little book here, because because this is one of the first um, really attempts to classify all of these different types of lines, and actually it is amazing how many different types of lines there are. This is one of, you know, the first attempts in the world to do this, because 
Um, one of the things that I think I've always found uh, quite confusing is people use things like earth energies, ley lines, uh, dragon lines, spirit lines, dream paths, all sorts of terms in almost interchangeably and it's yeah. well are they the same thing or aren't they and you you've really approached it very scientifically and it's very clear that there's an awful lot of things going on and they're not all the same thing at all no there's definitely differences between them and and, and there's uh, i'll go into it in a bit detail uh, as to the, the sort of reasons for the differences but mm. the first thing to say about classifications are they're for communication purposes, really, and they're work in progress. I mean, we, we have the same thing with rocks and, and geology. Um, you can you can classify them quite simply into sedimentary, metamorphic, and igneous, and you're covering all the rocks completely there. But then you can start talking about the types of igneous rocks, and you might know things like granite and basalts and things like that. But mm. we can, geologists, we can we can further classify it down to the nth degree, and and it won't mean anything to anybody else apart from other geologists. So, mm. so, find something we can use that helps people understand what we're talking about. So this is, uh, in many ways, I would say it's the first classification and, um, in order to be able to help us communicate with each other mm. and ask them. And they've been classified in, in, in essentially several ways. One of them is, is what I think is two different sources. Uh, one is a more electromagnetic magnetic source and one is a, a sound source. Mm. Um, and the, the lines are differentiated by their nature with regards to uh, those two sources. Uh, then you've got uh, something called the frequency of lines. Um, the, the, the lines I discovered uh, aren't stable. They actually have a side-to-side -side movement. They swing from one side to the other side, and, and they take different lengths of time to do this. You don't find this on the nodes where they intersect, but you find them in the sort of middle of nowhere where there's no sacred sites at all. But mm. you actually measure these things every hour, they sort of move a little bit, they move a bit more. Um, to the extent that some of the, the wider, more powerful lines can take something like 24 hours to go one way and then 24 hours to go back the other way. Uh, the St. Michael and Mary line, for instance, take 12 hours to go one way and 12 hours to go the other way. And mm. the smaller lines, uh, that, I mean, I say smaller, but they're the sort of narrow in width. But, uh, they can be uh, slightly faster and it's like 12 hours one way, 12 hours the other way. Yeah. So that in itself didn't help uh, differentiate between the lines, but what, what was begun to be dis discovered when I was mapping the area of lines in, in, in Wiltshire, where I lived at the time, was that um, these energy lines behaved uh, as, as groups of lines. And so there was a... Mm not just a whole spread of lines across lots of different frequencies. There was a lot at a certain frequency and then a lot at another frequency. Mm. So you began to find uh, that the groups themselves, the groups of lines that had different frequencies. And that was a further differentiator between the types of lines. Um, and then there was other, other types of lines which are, had, had strange movements, uh, which were completely different, mm. had definite connections with things like the moon. Um, so that further differentiated uh, another group of lines as well. Yeah, there yeah, must have been a point where you thought, oh my goodness, what am I doing? <laughs> well, I think the, the point that I, I reached there was I, I initially decided to, to map an area which was much, much bigger. It was stretching up to Gloucester, across to the Forest of Dean, and all the way past Swindon, uh, and then down to, to Pusey and that sort of thing. And this was a huge area. And mm. The point that I suddenly reined in a little bit and I realized that there were so many more lines than I thought first thought of. Mm. Initially I just decided to follow a line that was mentioned in the Sun and the Serpent actually. I mean Hamish talked about a, a, a person he'd met uh, who'd come across a, another energy line coming out of Avebury aside from the St. Michael and Mary ones which he, he was mapping with her Paul mm. Broadhurst. And um, he'd followed this line to a small clump of trees um, about a couple of kilometers away from the, from the center of Avery. And because I lived not too far, I thought, well, I'll just nip along there and see what happened. And <laughs> it didn't end there, it just continued. <laughs> <laughs> I, ended up, I ended up mapping this line for kilometers in both directions. And uh, and then it, it led from there. I thought, well, maybe I need to find out what's going on. But um, as soon as I realized there were a lot more lines than, than that, the, I had to reduce the size of the area. And that was my first realization this was a huge subject yes yeah 
Yes, in you've got you've got a picture in this little book um, that shows some of the mapping that you've done in in the area. Um, let's, I don't people probably can't see that, but it's, it's a little show you perhaps on, on on the screen here. That's probably uh, got, uh, yeah, you've got that. that there. Brilliant. I've been in, and it's just a mass. So you uh, know, just bear with me a little bit here. So this was. Um, um, just tell me when you've got it. Whoops. Yeah, I'm seeing your screen. Yeah, there we go. I want, I want this one here. You, can you see that screen? I can see that. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, this is the, the North Wiltshire map. Um, you can see the, that's the, gone. the that's red gone. Oh, there line. It is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the red lines there are the St. Michael and Mary lines. You see them crossing over here uh, in at Avebury. Yeah. Cross over again here, just north of Devizes at Oliver's Castle, and then back here, uh, just outside uh, Melksham, uh, the mm -hmm. cross over again there. But um, the blue lines are the Type 3 lines. I, I call the St. Michael and Mary Type 4. The blue ones are Type 3 lines, and you can see that they're, they all run in pairs. Yeah. Uh, and, and the pairs tend to follow a, a straight alignment. And you can see the north-south ones here again. Up mm. Like that, and they run in pairs, and you've got some ones which run sort of northeast, southwest, and and, and, and southeast to, to uh, yeah, and the other way around. And then, yeah, the, the significant thing about this is, and, and what I take away is that um, the alignment themselves that is the lay, that's the lay line, some people call it. So yeah, the Michael line, as, as you know, runs all the way along from. Cornwall up to East Anglia. The alignment is the lay, the lay line, some people call it. And that's the straight line. Yeah, but with that, you then mm. have a pair of Earth energy lines, and so you can see all of mm. these as pairs. Yeah. But they follow straight alignments. Um, and and so, the, so the pair of lines, they weave round the so-called lay. They do. Uh, yeah. they, they cross over at the nodes, uh, and, which tend to be uh, where there are sacred places. Uh, and the, some of these nodes are, are have more lines crossing over than others, um, and they they tend to be more significant areas where, where there's the sacred sites and it could be you know, cathedrals, churches, or, or stones or standing stones, that sort of thing. Mm. So if I just come out of that one, or you can actually move to uh, a, a different one. It just uh, so it shows the St Michael type lines. Which are um, right? Can you see that? No, you want to share screen again. I think. All right, bear with me again. All right. And there we go. Yep. You got that? Yep. Okay. So now this is a a map of the type four alignments, and you can see here. Uh, the Glastonbury sits here, St Michael's Mount sits here, and Royston's here. Now that is the St yeah. Michael alignment, and you see one line there, but that actually yeah. is consisting of two pairs, of a pair of earth energy lines. It's, it's yeah. St Michael line. But of, of the other type four lines that you can find uh, across this country, these alignments here, there's another one here running through Royston, yeah. and the New Grange and Mabes Cairn. That again has two pairs of lines, and, and, and that, that too. Great, great fun mapping that across the country. Yeah, and that, that one comes looks like it comes comes in north of where I am because I'm in Mid Wales. Yeah, yeah. Have you named that one? Well, that became a problem trying to find names for all these. <laughs> I, I just call them after the, the names that they they go through. So that's that, that's like the Royston Newgrange alignment. Okay. Um, mm. um, there's another interesting one here, the Glastonbury. And the long yeah. stones on the Isle of Wight, and yeah. that runs up just uh, past the Gower, you know, mm -hmm. two sites and into Ireland. Uh, and then you've got these two meridian type lines which go north south again. Mm -hmm. They're all the same sort of width; they have the same frequencies, uh, and and that's what makes them the, the type four type lines. And when you say width, what are you what are you talking about? Well. And this is where it gets slightly difficult because the width does change. It has a natural. Uh, so I just move out of the screen, sorry. Mm -hmm. The the widths have a uh, uh, a natural pulse. It go backwards and forwards. 
yeah. uh, over, over, the, over the hours you can find this mouse. And um, that's not quite what we're talking about here, but um, the uh, individually we all find the lines are slightly different widths as it is. And I think mm -hmm. that's down to our sensitivities. I mean, I have a friend, Phil, who, who measures all the widths twice as wide as I do, which right. uh, it is interesting because that's, that's his take on the width. But he yeah. finds frequency the same as I do, and he finds the center of the lines the same as I do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the widths and, uh, also uh, contributed to the makeup of the lines to bands within the lines. And Billy Gorn, who's uh, one of the best jazzers perhaps uh, that we've had in the UK for uh, has done a lot of research on, on, on the inner bands within these lines. Mm. Uh, they also contribute to why a line is a certain width. And, and, and what I, I touched on earlier with, with the conversation with you with regards to the way lines are changing is that uh, yeah. these widths have been uh, increasing since the summer of, of last year. Uh, I know when you, you sit and meditate on a line, you can increase the width, but I'm not talking about that now. We're talking about uh, an external influence that's affected these, these widths. Mm. If you look at the lines in more detail, you find that a band, a particular band in them is, the, is what's actually widened and the other bands haven't. Mm. So something's been going on since uh, summer last year, and we, we, we've been studying that for some time. But rather than going to that just now, <laughs> back to the, 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 the alignments themselves, and so... They, they were the type 4 alignments, they have two pairs of energy lines and uh, the, the more powerful, the lower frequency ones, they tend to be less common mm. than the smaller, higher frequency ones, if you like. And I talk about frequencies and, and the side to side movement, but these are very, very low frequencies. And one of the reasons why they've not been picked up before by any electromagnetic uh, means, uh, uh, because these are down at the microhertz level. Right. So. The instruments uh, that currently try and measure vibrations that geologists use, like super cold cooled gravimeters and things like that, uh, they can be measuring things for two weeks in Antarctica just to pick up uh, vibrations at around about 3,000 microhertz. Uh, and they haven't yet got equipment that can pick up accurately these measurements. So the only way we can pick up these frequencies is using these uh, dowsing frequencies. Yeah, back. and I think that's that's a really important point because there's lots of people who say, oh, you know, earth energies, ley lines, blah, blah, poo, poo, poo sort of thing. But, I mean, what you're saying is, um, which is exactly what happened with human meridian lines, these were laughed at and ridiculed for many years until until they found the way to to actually prove them scientifically and you're saying we just don't have the instruments it's not that they're not there the instruments are not well, sensitive enough to pick them up we do and we don't we have instruments but we can't pick the, the information up directly there's a way mm. of picking this up indirectly and i'll explain what i mean mm. um, that the nature of the observations we've been making on these energy lines for some time now have, have shown that there's a very strong connection to sound mm. and I, when i talk about sound it's not in the true sense of the word, just sound, because there's an element of consciousness I'm not going to go into just now that's connected to sound. Yeah. But I'm not going to be able to talk about that in any way today. But if we think of it as sound, um, sound has uh, harmonics. Yeah. So you, you have higher harmonics of, of, of a sound. It's like a, uh, if you play a note, then the octave above, you'll find that the vibrations are also picked up. Yeah. So the fundamental movements of these energy lines have higher harmonics, and, and these can be picked up, and we think that's what's happening with something called the mysterious hum. Yeah. Uh, ever since geologists have been measuring volcanoes and, and earthquakes, they, they, they kind of thought that the, the vibrations would slow down and would stop after a while, but they never did. And they, they soon began to realize that the Earth is constantly humming. And so they yeah. Work, um, um, like mysterious hum, and they've been on a search as to what on Earth this is, has been causing this. And they've been uh, trying to cut out things like the, the, the movement of the ocean at depth over the different levels of, of, of the seafloor to try and eliminate what could be creating this. And they've still came up with uh, uh, what they call eigen modes. Eigen mm -hmm. modes are, are little uh, groups of frequencies of, of very, very low frequencies in this particular case. And I found that particularly interesting because uh, the frequencies of eigen modes that they, they picked up were octaves of the groups of energy lines that I've been finding which are at a lower fundamental beat around mm. 5 to 25 microhertz and, and um, 
to have eigen modes that is essentially of sound, you, you, you're talking about having gaps where, in frequencies where there is no sound. And then you've got sound, and then there's no sound. So it's little gaps, yeah. they call phenonic band gaps, but they're just no sound and then sound. But this is exactly what you would get uh, from something called a mechanical filter. Uh, and when you when you put uh, energy into a mechanical filter, it'll all filter out certain frequencies only use, and, mm. and not others. And um, this was again uh, an indication that these earth energy lines possibly were linked to sound. Mm. Uh, when I was looking at where these sounds could come from, you have to consider that when the Earth rotates, just like the magnetic North Pole, that magnetic North Pole rotates with the Earth as the Earth rotates. So you know, they know that it, whatever's causing the position of that magnetic North Pole must come from the Earth itself and not externally to it. Mm. Like these Earth energy lines, they don't rotate. They, they're fairly fixed to the ground. So that has to come from the Earth itself. And yeah. the only thing that was beginning to look like it could do that was the iron nickel in a core. Mm. And... The iron nickel in a core, uh, well, iron and nickel is a fantastically good transducer. Mm. Transducers you find in things like microphones, they'll take electrical energy and convert it to uh, sound energy, and it'll do the other things wrong. They'll take sound energy and convert it to electricity. Uh, and uh, what, what's happening, I think, in the center of the Earth is that you've got massive pressure and heat and gravitational energy, also electrical energy from, from the magnetic field, being converted into sound energy. Mm -hmm. In a core, you've got this sound energy which emanates out in sound bubbles, if you like, continually. But it's not emanating out in every single frequency because iron and nickel is also this mechanical filter, which yeah. can have some frequencies. So what we're getting is, is, is just select groups of sound emanating from the core, going out and back, bouncing off the different mm -hmm. uh, parts of the inside of the earth. And, um, and, and these vibrations have high and low pressures. And when you have that on the surface, what, what I can just show you now on another uh, thing is, 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 is it's a typical sort of impression that you get on the surface if you look at spherical sound waves. I'm just come up now. Just tell me if you can see. Yeah, I can see that. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, wrong one. Sorry, yeah, this one's here. There we go. Yeah. So this yeah. is. Uh, uh, people working on a titanium atom with regards to light and reflected spherical uh, standing waves of light from the center of the atom to the surface. Mm -hmm. And again, with like this high and low pressure zones. So and what we're talking about here is how do spherical standing waves of high and low pressure, how do they look on the surface of a sphere? And mm. you get on this surface of a sphere a mixture of, of grand circles, uh, going right way around and all on here and then lots of intersections. In fact, it's, 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 it's like a model of the Earth energy lines and how they're viewed around, around the Earth with the nodes here and the, and, and the energy lines as great. Yeah. So what essentially, uh, uh, it, it's not, the Earth doesn't have that exact model, but what we're looking at is uh, these spherical sound energies being able to create bands of high pressure uh, energies on the surface when I think these earth energy lines are, are high pressure uh, areas. I mean, they're, they're, they're actually really very beautiful patterns aren't they? They are uh, mm. often disturbed with geography and, and different rock types and things like that for being perfect but uh, mm. what what we're finding on the earth of course is these different sound lines have different frequencies yep. and there's gaps so if you've got one at 48 hours and then one at 36 hours and one at 24 hours. You've got none, for instance, at 33 hours or 27 hours, and you've got none at sort of like 17 hours. There are groups of frequencies, mm. and gaps, and then more frequencies, and then gaps, just as you would expect from a mechanical filter, and just as you would ex as was being picked up uh, at a higher level on, on a higher octave with these super cool, gra super cool gravimeters uh, with, with their eigen frequencies. There again, groups. Yeah sound and not just one sound across the whole spectrum yeah and can we can we can we surmise anything from that yeah I think it's or, a good are, are we still kind of like scratching our heads about it? It, it 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 leads us with a hypothesis to say well we need to test these to see whether or not they're very low frequency sounds yeah. or we can treat them as low frequency sounds and and the implications of that with regards to for instance living above areas it's just it's come off that 
uh, living above, above areas with with, uh, with these sounds uh, underneath us, mm. uh, and, and this sound itself, or very low frequency sound uh, outside of our, our hearing, is known to, to to be harmful to us. So um, we can begin to see how sound affects us uh, in many ways when we can hear it, but uh, how bad that is. If you can imagine mm. living on top of a horrible sound all the time, that's going to possibly be jarring for your health. And uh, yeah. alternatively, if you can tune some wonderful sounds out of a node and be, be next to a beautiful, wonderful sounding environment, that, that will be very conducive to harmonious living. Mm. Although we can't prove it, definitely there's an indirect link here that uh, it's telling us that uh, a large proportion of these energies are sound-based. Uh, that's not all of it, though, because there are some which are, are almost certainly electromagnetic-based. Mm. Uh, which are stemming from ground induction currents that come from um, a transformer effect from the, the effect from the sun. Yeah, and these the, the Hartman and Curry grids. Hartman Curry grids and the Benke lines, uh, mm. definitely more electromagnetic. And, and also um, David Cowan has been finding, uh, I think, what are more electromagnetic lines uh, running between volcanoes and sort of paleomagnetism that, that uh, allows for. Uh, that kind of current to exist uh, between uh, those kinds of sites, definitely. Yeah. So there's uh, quite a few different times. Yeah, looking, I mean, looking at um, that little map you showed us of all the lines earlier, um, different kinds of lines, whether they're sound lines or the um, magnetic ones, it's almost inevitable that we're going to be living on some of these or they're going to be passing through our houses and things like that is there a difference a between the different types of lines as to how they affect us and b how do they affect us yeah well um you've got to consider the fact that we've evolved in this environment mm. uh, and life has evolved so you know it, it's not going to have occurred if most of these lines weren't good for us and, yeah. and i think the first thing to say is that uh, nearly all the lines are fine yeah, uh, we have discovered one or two that have frequencies that cause difficulties for humans, and and then now we get into the realms of well, how long are you living on top of these particular lines? Mm. And um, on on a certain particular certain type lines, we call type MP lines, they're connected to the moon phase, and that that has given people huge difficulties, and the it, 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 their living tissue has become uneased. Mm. Just, and illness and, and cancers and all sorts of things can come if you're living on those lines for too long. And, and we never used to live in one area for very long. We mm. would move and migrate a whole location of the town and along these lines can pilgrimage to these two other ones. And so it's only this modern day of living that we suddenly find ourselves uh, having to live on, on lines generally or, or even worse still mm. some of these bad lines. Um, but even living on a, on a good energy line, uh, has an, am an amazing effect on, on people because it accentuates emotions. So yeah. You can be positive and be really, really positive. And you can be negative and then really, really negative. It, it tends to accentuate. So just living on good lines, is, uh, it's difficult if you're taking the wrong sort of mental attitude. <laughs> um, so we uh, come back to mental attitude being really important. <laughs> absolutely, in, in most of these cases. And, and, and but the, the, the difficulty was recently, as I was alluded to slightly earlier, is that... Uh, the lines are growing in size uh, in width and they're growing because of an external influence uh, a galactic influence which is now energies and cosmic rays which are getting through onto this earth which previously hadn't got through because we have three magnetic shields which are, are shielding us the earth's magnetic field the sun's magnetic field and, and we're also sitting inside and our, our solar system sitting inside something called the local cloud which is again another magnetic shield but uh, space probes going beyond the heliosphere have now shown that we're exiting from that cloud and, and more cosmic rays are getting through. And it's, uh, there's evidence to show cosmic rays can affect DNA and mutate DNA. So um, we're going into a new environment and we're finding these energy lines are connected to these galactic energies. Mm. And that brings us to the, the largest types of lines of all. And although the largest we have in this country are the type four, St. Michael and Mary, we have type five lines. Uh, mm -hmm. which are, we've called the emperor dragons and currently we have uh, three pairs of these that go around the world uh, that's six lines mm -hmm. uh, and, and and where are they are we allowed to ask <laughs> well yeah uh, it, it's, it's it's difficult to answer these exactly because <laughs> <laughs> But, but the, How many the near, have you gone around the world mapping them <laughs> well we have we have done remote mapping we know where they are um, yeah 
the nearest node, I mean, because they cross over each other, the nearest node is in southeast of Spain, right. um, which is where we, we took an expedition in 2012 because that was a node that needed repairing. Um, but you can track these lines and they, they, they cross through Europe and across over to the, to the Middle East. And um, mm. uh, there's another amazing site that, it run, they, that they run through called Mount Kailash. Um, yeah. But the, 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 yeah, it would take a long time to explain where they all run, but they go through incredible sites yeah. and, and unknown sites as well, which are fairly amazing. Mm. Um, but we've got another energy line, Dragon, that joined us in January because so these extra galactic energies came through. So this is like, it's like a new line being born. It, well, or, or has reappeared after several hundred years from, from before. Oh, right. Yeah, perhaps yeah. the local cloud and the magnetic fields had, had, had been down in the past when the energies came through in the past. And this particular pair of lines run from the North Pole to the South Pole. Uh, and again, run through some amazing sites. But we've, we've got this increase in energies. And they're the type, type 5 lines, which we call the, the Emperor Dragons. Mm. Um, but we don't have any of those in the UK. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the other interesting thing is that these lines don't behave like the other lines as well. Where well, you mentioned before earlier that these lines cross over as they follow the alignment. Mm. In the Emperor Dragons, they don't cross over at all each other unless they cross over on the nodes. And they only node in six places. And there's two in the water and four on land. So they have a very different nature. In fact, when you when you try and bring these emperor dragons together, mm. they repel each other. They fight each other. They, they repel. They like two oh, they repel. Uh, same, yeah. same ends of the magnet. They push each other back. So wow. trying to repair them was a problem. We didn't weren't quite sure how that was going to happen. But uh, so so well, that 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 begs two questions. First of all, how do you know it's broken? And secondly, yeah. how do you repair it? Well. well um, this the, fir the first indication that lines could be moved by humans was 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 found by Hamish Miller working in um, Abu Tasman National Park in New Zealand where he mm. he, he found a, a node which wasn't complete in the place a rock promontory called the navigator and he found one line that was just at a few feet away and it didn't look right and he asked permission to move it and it, it twanged back into place so we, we kind of learned from that that lines could be moved, and we sort of asked the questions as to, well, how should they be moved back? What what, what does good look like, if you like? Yeah. Mm. Power, what good looks like is is a symmetry. Yeah. So two pairs of, of of the lines cross over in, in a way that there's the symmetry involved. Mm. Have symmetry. Um, interesting things start happening with these energy lines uh, because. Mm. They're very dynamic. Uh, they, 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 they have, apart from that constant side-to-side -side movement, uh, the bands inside them have uh, flow directions. Right. So these flow directions are like 360 degrees, and they alter all the time. But every now and again, uh, from, from, from having a predominant flow direction, there's a neutral flow direction. And if you can mm. imagine two streams meeting, normally when you find the faster stream meeting a, a slower stream, you'll find the slower stream just gets swept up with the current yeah but when you've got two equal streams you find where they, the waters meet you get these tiny vortices right. very often you'll find at node areas like in Avebury, there are little tiny vortices every now and again now what tiny vortices do is if they're contained like in water with a containment field that's circular mm. then these tiny vortices will join up into a large big vortex yeah and uh when the vo large vortex occurs, um, then um, we find that's at the same time as when these energy lines all seem to move in harmony. Right. And when they all move in harmony, there's no predominant flow. Vortices can build. Yeah. In a really, really strong vortex, it, it, and, and then you have to have a cylinder around it, and you only get that perfect cylinder when you have a symmetry of low, no, low lines crossing over. Mm. I'll show you a video in a minute. Okay, so you, can, <laughs> um, you you can then move on from the vortex, which is uh, this is cup shaped and a bit grail shaped, if you like. Yeah. Through to something which happens only four times a year, and that is the collapse of of, of this uh, cylinder into a double torus with a vortex in it, and and that is the for me the key thing because we need to meditate in, in groups in in that shape. Let me let me show you with with yeah. uh, moving from that. In what I what I mean in uh, in uh, let's see 
Yeah, just bear with me a second. Yeah, that, uh, I need to get out of this and move on. I'm not sure if I'm sharing that or not. I'm going to share it again. No, you need to share the screen again. Yeah, no. hang on. Won't be long. Spherical standing sound wave patterns on the surface of the Earth. Yeah, so um, that is how it. I'll talk about this bit first. Okay. You can see. Can you see mm -hmm. that? Yeah, can see that. You can see uh, the containment field here. Yeah. Uh, is sufficient and it has to be circular. So mm. that the small vortices can build to a large vortices. Now, if you don't have the right energy lines crossing over in symmetry, you yeah. don't have a circular containment field, and the big vortex can't grow. Right. And then once it's grown, uh, it, it, that happens when all the energy lines, all the groups themselves, come into harmony. So it's but a very specific set of circumstances that creates this. Absolutely. Well, well mm. each each group type of energy line will have this its own harmony period every every few weeks. Yeah, but, but four times a year, all the energies start moving together, and that, that's an amazing thing. They, 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 they seem to sort of shorten their distance, increase their speed, or slower their speed to get that. And well, is that is that when we're talking about that? Are we really talking about solstices and equinoxes? Or yes, that's the day before the solstices and equinoxes. Right. Got this picture of the of the cross crossover segment lines here. Yep. Yep. Okay, that's that's that's. that's Imagine two pairs of energy lines crossing over, and yeah. there's a circular energy in there. If I go to the uh, play button here, you can see naturally that's what looks what, what an energy line node will look like. That's yeah. symmetry. And as you progress into the point where that group comes into harmony, you'll find a vortex beginning to appear like this. Wow! Mm. If it's a really strong vortex, it'll suck in at the sides. This is what happens four times a year, and suddenly you'll get that double torus. Wow. That's when the gate opens or the port opens and, and you've got interesting analogies there with copper wire and, and, and resonance and above and about and below. Um, I'm just going to the next one. This is the actual one you can see as though uh, you were above ground and, and this is uh, just the top part. Is uh, this Avery? That's actually Stanton Drew. That's Stanton Drew, is it? Hmm. There's the vortex forming and then oh. you're meditating in that short harmony time period and there you've got that which has got that cauldron like look uh, again as well some people call that grail look as well uh, and i think that's what the templars were looking for uh, they're looking for the largest node uh, around um, and that's because yeah. they knew about these formations i think so. yeah so if you're meditating in that when that happens what have, have you done that we do that. Uh, we have gatherings uh, four times a year. At okay. Hattie's, Hattie's, uh, we do it at Oliver's Castle, Glastonbury, and uh, at uh, Stanton Drew. Um, mm -hmm. We're trying to expand that, and uh, the idea eventually is to get uh, groups of people meditating all around the world yeah. on these key days. In fact, they were the ancient Hebrew holy days, which I mentioned in my book. And it, 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 that these holy days were passed down by word of mouth. This, um, when you say your book, it's this book now Real found book. Yeah. 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 Real found. it appears that the templars found out about these uh these times mm. and, uh, and they found out about that in jerusalem and they were looking for these intersections like the ones at chartres mm. uh, uh, and other places like caravaca which i mentioned there the, the, the nodal intersections which are symmetric because they, they i think for them and, they were, and also some of the grail writers uh, like the the, the one the, the writer that wrote Palesmaus, we talked about the grail being invisible and having many shapes. And you can see if that, if that is correct, then this is an invisible energy which has many shapes. It's absolutely. <laughs> the cup and the cauldron. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, the effect, I mean, what, what happens when the energy field changes so dramatically like that? What, what, why would the Templars, for example, or are, ancestors be so interested in that well you've got to look at what they considered to be the grail properties which was rejuvenation enlightenment manifestation healing they're, they're the main ones and um mm. you just have to find the right way to meditate and pray within those and that's a little bit getting the right sounds 
mm. so it's resonating with the, the, the double torus and its own resonance and uh, yeah. finding the right sound so that your bone body resonates with these uh, with these energies the same thing and you can see you can see also from um, uh, modern day technology that the people who've uh, wound equal lengths of copper wire uh, into a torus shape above and below and then they put different uh, put the same frequency of sound pulsing through these different toruses mm. and you get these effects where the, the unipolar magnetism can occur and you get amplification of energy which is occurring it's, it, it's almost as though this this shape, uh, when it resonates with each other, uh, opens up some some gate from somewhere else. So yeah. what we're, we're thinking is these these are gates to uh, other fields of energy that uh, exist. So um, meditate very them, very very healing. Healing is absolutely one. It's yeah. that the energies get to the very root of the matter in your own body and, and reconfigure mm. that matter. Matter matter is nothing but energy anyway. So it's like. Uh, rejuvenation as well um, yeah. people who live on these nodes don't seem to age as fast yeah I'm 93 <laughs> 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 but, but, but anyway your own personal node <laughs> the manifestation the the uh, more commonly known law of attraction uh, yep. manifesting what we need for our vocation in life that's what the Templars believed and and, and, and enlightenment as well connecting they, they also uh, thought this was a place where they could communicate with with uh, angels that have been on the, exist the world before. Right. And the Hebrews talked about the angel of Tippereth from the sphere of Tippereth from the Kabbalah, the mm. one well, of the central uh, uh, world there was was called Tippereth, and, and yeah. they considered that beings from that world, the angels, the people who passed over from this world, were able to be spoken with and um, and would come through a bit like modern day materialization and the materialization mediums that do that. So there are a lot of things that, that are positive by being on this. Yeah. So but, it's, it's, it's like, you know, they, they talk in the Celtic tradition, they talk about, um, you know, the veil between the worlds. Yes. Potentially, like, this was, these are points where we can move between dimensions. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is what we're thinking is uh, happening. And the different energy lines and different frequencies and different groups lead to different types of nodes with different gateways to different worlds. Right. Yeah. Wow. So <laughs> you, you can a lot more mapping to be done from the sound of it. <laughs> the, the, the positions of these nodes were very important and the, and the sanctity of them was worth defending. And um, yeah. what we found in the southeast of Spain was that the, the there was a group of people, later called the Argaric people, that had made a pilgrimage of over 2,000 miles from the other side of the Mediterranean just to get to this one place in southeast Spain. And this is a tiny little conical hill. Yeah. which is shaped like a pyramid and at the top they built their most sacred place and at the bottom they had huge huge brick foundations and this the archaeologists were really puzzled when they found this mm. because this is the site of the largest bronze age city on mainland in europe and and uh they don't know why it was placed there <laughs> they don't and, have and no idea why people two thousand miles to it i mean there's yeah. and it's not on the mouth of a river it's not on a trading yeah. river it's not on the highest piece of ground in that area and yet from what we know, we know that's where the intersection of lines met. So this was their very, very sacred place. And they knew they were following these lines to get to this place. Yeah. Um, and yeah. knew the benefits because of it. And I think that's where the legend of these grail properties originated from. And, huh? and people were aware of this place and, and the properties. Yeah. So I suspect that the grail legend itself mm. was started with Crétien de Troyes, uh, uh, um, it was literally uh, the grail was a french dish yeah we talked about was the the wafer which was a holy thing sustaining the the the, 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 um, the fisher king's father so uh it was uh, the continuations of the story and the later versions which added more to the grail being more of a holy vessel where yeah it was the vessel that caught the blood of christ and, and shared the, the, the wine. yeah and, 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 i yeah. talked with one or one or two of the people who who um i've been talking to i mean they talk about how you know there is truth in myth that the the, the, the myths and the stories are encoding information mm. and knowledge um for us so they're teaching stories if we know how to read them so exactly the same with, with the grail there's there's embedded within that if you just have the key <laughs> mm. there's there's wisdom riches to be found yeah but the, the, the grail is also found popping up in, in in stories in the middle east and also in the far east and, and if you think mm. of 
grail as a cauldron. Yeah. And again, the, the similarities there with the grail properties go back far further. Um, yeah. And um, at the time of the grail stories as well, there was a huge uh, schism again going on within the church with regards to the Gnosticism and the, and the Roman Catholicism. And, and that too was born out, I think, in the hidden messages that were going around, especially within the Grail stories, and trying to get the Grail story to be the most popular, the one with your particular hidden message in it. Yeah. And possibly why the story Pelespas was written was to try and show the connection to Gnosticism. Like Wolfram von Eschenbach's story of Parzimal, uh, he again links more to uh, Gnosticism with the Stone of Cathars and, and mm. trying to promote that message. Of course, the Catholic Church was trying to push their message on uh, the Grail being the cup of Christ. So. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we know that the Roman Catholic Church basically won the battle at the material level, at, as in they wiped out the Cathars and they wiped out the Knights Templar. But there's still this understanding that, that's remained with us yeah. in the stories. Yes, it's... It, it's it seems to have survived as the, this sort of spiritual age is now connecting with this more. Um, mm. I think the, the other thing which which is quite shocking is the, the fact we are really unaware of the hundreds and thousands of people around the world who are meditating in groups in, in spiritual harmony, and, mm. and, and we're just not getting news of that anywhere, but it's going on. Yeah. Uh, and, and people are turning away from some of the atrocities that are found in religions today. And they're looking for something different. There's a meaning. They're looking for a deeper meaning to life because they know there's something out there. And there's a growing awareness of something. And that, again, is linked, I think, to these energies. Yeah. But can, well, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to just go a little bit more into this new Earth grid and, and, and what's yeah. changing at that level. And then, if we could, can we go on and talk a little bit uh, sure. about this before, uh, before we sort of finish up? Because I, I feel that two are coming coming together and and it's important <laughs> she says <laughs> just a little bit <laughs> yeah so the, the 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 new earth grid um these emperor lines are part of that and these the, this new one that's come in and you were saying as well that there are possibly more the the predictive dowsing is such that there's two more energies coming through um two more emperor dragons and they, yeah. they'll be doing in december and they take a few months to get to get bedded in yeah when you've got uh, these energies are coming in from 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 other galaxies and they're getting mm. past this local cloud now because it's not there or it's just got so weak uh you have a direct effect where the energies are hitting us directly on the surface there's also mm. an effect where these energies are coupling with with the sun Mm. Uh, on a by huge intergalactic transformer effect, if you like, where, uh, where and say a transformer effect is when you have interacting magnetic fields, yeah. power is transmitted along them electrically. And then you've got the same inter interconnecting magnetic fields between the sun and the earth, and power is transmitted across that. And there are some scientists now that are accepting that uh, power can get right through to the center of our earth. So the, the, the type four lines, for instance, which are powered, mm. I think, from the sun. Yeah like the St. Michael and Mary, uh, get through into our inner core and are then, with the mechanical filter, it's sent out as energies at 24 hours. Right. Well, and that, that then comes to the surface. So with the galactic energies coming through into the sun and onto the surface of our Earth, that's two ways they're coming to us. And yeah. the third way is they're coming from, from the inner core up and back out at us. So we're getting a three-pronged attack of extra energies. Uh, yeah. Now, such as as it is, when these energies come back into the Earth, the, the lines aren't quite li linking up with the existing grid. So they're making new intersections which aren't completely where the old intersections were. So it's like you've got to make that, that line connect up with the node. So it's, it's yeah. like yeah. this new grid has got to connect up with the It's, just, the it's just fine adjustments. Where it needs to be, yeah. So mm. uh, we... we, we, we find an area where, where the, the, these new lines run through and the nodes have got to, the, the difficulty with these galactic energies is we found in Spain is that uh, you can't do it on your own. Yeah. Whereas we, we could individually move these type four, three, two, and one lines and the other lines, you can move them. And they may not like being moved, they move back sometimes. So you've got to find a way <laughs> of anchoring them. And, and there's, there's also the 
rather strange situation where you've got to move some first and then others next and sometimes you have different groups of people holding some back before you let them others in there's, well, there's, there's techniques to do that but yeah yeah mm. the galactic ones seem this to is not, not for the faint-hearted for the sound of it <laughs> well i was curious it's just not they're not, they're not uh, dangerous it's just for the, the trick with this is asking the right questions and getting the right mm. if you haven't got the questions you can't get, get the answers to know what to do but uh mm. the the galactic energies we can't do that on our own we have to have at least three people who are in agreement with what's going on and so yeah. it seems to be uh, yeah fail safes if you like so things can't be manipulated the wrong way yeah uh, which is good that, that's what we're talking about knitting these the, the grids in and, okay. and there's, there's a bit more there's also sky grids as well which which uh, i don't get so involved with but i know people who do work with sky sky grids and they're going to have to be knitted in with the energies and um yeah. That's part of what people feel that their caretakers and, and, and light workers and grid workers do. Is they look after locally where, where, where they know uh, energies are coming in and ensuring that, uh, yeah. for, for instance, in Stanton Drew, um, there must have been people looking after that place for centuries because when I first came across it and mapped it, nothing needed to be done. It was, it was perfect. Right. So you know that some places have been, have been looked after for many, many years by, by locals who you'll never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah there's this whole um i'll use the word occult because it just means hidden uh, there's this whole occult level of knowledge that potentially sits within certain areas that shall i say um the more orthodox levels of our, our society are unaware about unaware of well yeah even um even yesterday, I, I was talking to a chap who told me about this uh, Swiss hotel owners that had been looking after this place for over 2,000 years. And, this, and, and, and they had this, this handed down through generations over generations, and generations that their role was to look after the energy of the people who came to stay there because they were aware of, of how uh, energy changes in the environment for people who, who are not used to these energies. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's almost like lost knowledge. Yes. It's, it's not it's not a cultist or anything it's just known by just a few small groups of people yeah. that have handed it down for years and years and years yeah yeah mm -hmm. and we're only just beginning to uncover that right? yeah that's wonderful so can we can we sort of go on from the earth grid in the changes you know the changes that potentially bring do you have any sense of the changes that that is going to bring as yeah as develops the and again, we can, we can possibly link this to what some of the prophecies are talking about. Yeah. The Opie Indian Blue Kachina prophecy talk about uh, the twins arriving. And after the twins are arriving, you have seven years of transition. And if the north-south energy lines are the twins, which look like it could be, the transition zone they're talking about is, is, is one where we, we are going to have quite a lot of hardship. We're going to be tested and challenged mentally. Uh, mm. they, they talk about not being able to see the difference between dreams and reality. Uh, so we're, we're, we're going to be challenged with what we see and what we feel. Um, there's other, other people talking about how we're going to be far more aware of uh, other people uh, and mm -hmm. how they think and how they feel. So you could be near to somebody and, and feel the pain they're feeling. If they've got a pain in the shoulder, you'll feel a pain in the shoulder. And, and Steiner talked about this back in 1905 and again 1915 in, in some lectures. And he's talking about a time that he knows is coming is a return to group soulness where we're in an individual soulness right now where we will feel the pain the other where others feel pain one person feels pain we'll all feel pain mm. and there's this uh this is going to be a challenge as well for us as going forward mm. i think some people actually have already started feeling this yeah they're more aware of this and they're not quite sure why they're thinking this or why they're feeling these things and they are more sensitive than everyone else so it's our complete environment and i want to mention or again that the, we talk about energy lines but these are fields of energy mm. and their concentrations in a field so you may not even be on the energy line which is a high pressure concentration you may just be next to it or in the low pressure but it's still in the field yeah it's still yeah. going to have an effect but not quite such an extreme effect so it's it's it's, it's going to have an effect on every single person on this planet yeah um what what i see as a challenge is uh, and what also other prophecies talk about is that this is an opportunity for us to consciously evolve. Mm, mm. But if we do nothing, we won't. Mm. And it's a question of what we do. And, and for me, the, the, the concept is to 
bring, bring, bring ourselves together in group meditation in, in thousands of places all around the world in small groups. Yeah. Um, and, and to to let the energies program us. Yeah, work on us. The answers we need to come up with. And mm. I think if we, if we do that, we make ourselves accessible in that way, at these gateways, at these portals, then we are going to be infused infused with energy in, in such a way that our DNA is mutated mm. so that we are consciously evolving yeah. into what we, we should be expecting for what the Indians call the, the golden age. And, and, and there's so many prophecies you could point to, which is, uh, which is indicating the same thing. Yeah. So a period of difficulty, seven years they're talking about. So 2024, if the Hopi Indian seven year thing is right, mm. we're going to be challenged mentally. I mean, challenge physically more uh, in order to be able to test us and to make make, make us strong. Yeah, and I, th- I think I think well, we're we're definitely seeing that already playing out in this business yeah. with illusion and fake news and all of this. And um, yeah, there's there's definitely a sense that we're in a pressure cooker at all sorts of levels, um, both as individuals with having to face our stuff and become more authentic and. Yeah deal with deal with our baggage as it were as well as when you look out on the global scale you can feel you can feel things shifting and moving quite dramatically yeah. mm-hmm. uh, the evidence is there on the energy uh, the yeah. Is yeah. And, um, so so for all of those people you know listening in who are thinking oh my god you know bumpy ride yeah. um, maybe feeling a bit fearful um, that really isn't the way to be approaching it from what you're saying it's you know just understand that this is happening um yeah yeah it's very much keeping positive and and, and fear is fear is being forced upon us in many ways in order for us to to distract us from what we're trying to achieve so the, the the name of the day is to move from negative emotions to positive emotions and to be able to move from quickly from negative to positive and and fear is just one thing that's going to slow us down yeah so, so really getting control of our emotions at that level is is very important and keeping in the positive because from what you were saying, these lines will amplify whatever you're feeling. So if you, if you are plugging into the fear messages that are constantly, we're being bombarded with almost, de- well, it feels to me deliberately, yeah. um, it's going to impede it's going to we, 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 we mustn't ignore them. We mustn't suppress mm. them. I learned this underground on the minds and with, with working in, in, in life-threatening conditions. You, you can't suppress fears. You can't ignore fears. Mm. What that does is it stifles them subconsciously and you end up having an erratic life because of that. Yeah. You actually have to embrace and acknowledge and accept that these things exist before yeah. shifting to the positive. Okay. So it's not about an exercise of, of suppression or ignoring them yeah. or avoiding them. It's yeah. Not, that's what's going on, but I'm going to choose not to feel that way. Yeah. And that's the ability to move from fear, from, from anger, from, from uh, uh, despair through to hope, to love, and to positive expectation is, is what we have to learn to do well. And, and we're all going to be challenged to do that because it's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the transition, and that's what we have to do. And I think We're also, all in this together. <laughs> well, I think coming together in small groups, in group meditation does empower us although we do things individually in group meditation we individually meditate the way we want to do we connect subconsciously and then the energies can come through and, and, and that helps massively with regards to uh, yeah if we would. so that, that's so, my message is to so four times a year on, on these inter- s- s- symmetrical intersection sacred science yeah 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 um, and um how would people find the these no points well, this is slightly harder. We're working on, on publicizing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, set up at the beginnings of a website, worldharmonytrust.org. Uh, I'll make sure that goes up. Mm-hmm. It's just beginning to, to tell people about this, and uh, we'll slowly be able to, to map where they are over the whole world. A lot of sites in there, and people know lots of sites anyway, so we're yeah. going to have the ability for people to contribute to, to where they know sacred sites are and where they can hold gatherings. And, and then everybody can then link up or go to, or, yeah. or at the same time, which is quite critical. Is yeah. med- and at the same time, not just meditating at the same time, but, but, but connecting with other groups. Yeah. And meditating at the same time. As soon as you connect with another group, it doesn't matter where they are, it seems to amplify the whole experience. It's and, like and this. I, I, I quite yeah. often have seen and been shown, there's like this great 
web yeah. um, and, and with lights at all of the, yeah. the, the noding points in that. And yeah. so it's like this great energetic web that if, when people do this will... Yeah, like, like Indra's net, which is the, the Indians were talking about. It, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, it lights uh, on the intersections, and I think we need to be little lights and, and be there. We don't need everyone to do this. I think maybe a few hundred thousand around the world, and yeah. we'll, that point a critical threshold of Sheldrake's morphic resonance that will actually then suddenly entrain all of our ways of thinking into yeah. being able to work with this new energetic environment in ways that will lift us yeah. to a new form of consciousness. And that's... Oh, it, I would hope that everybody who's part of this tele summit and listening in, because they've been drawn into it, that there's something here that we can all do. It's and you don't have to travel far. I mean, you do have to find a sacred place. You do have to find a symmetrical node, and you then find other people to meditate on it. And then it's about doing your own thing, connecting up. With yeah. And, and, and I hope in a massively decentralized way, because then, then it can't be stopped. Yeah. Before we finish, can I just very, very quickly talk to you a little bit about the Grail work? Because I know this is something that you're developing and is going to be sort of opening up. Just tell us a little bit about that. I, I, this feels so important to me um, that, that Rory's agreed that, that we're going to do another, another chat sometimes just about this because um, we don't have the time to do this justice, but just to introduce the flavour of it. Well, um, we did this work on repairing this energy line node down in the southeast of Spain, in a place called Murcia. Um, but it was shortly after that that we discovered that the net of energy lines stretched to a place called Calabaca de la Cruz. And on visiting this site, uh, again, uh, what we call a fourth order node, a very sacred site in its own right. And this was in a, one of the most southerly Templar sites in, in, in the whole of Europe. Uh, they left a message for their followers up there. Mm. Briefly show you this. Where am I? Now? Where am I sharing? Just quickly, and I'll show you this uh, uh, picture. You know what this is a, around the window. Oh gosh! Look at that. Oh, hang on, no. Got that? You got that one? Uh, surface kind of animation. I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, I'm seeing that. Yeah, and, and there are all these symbols around the outside of this window that was once a circular window, but they filmed it up. And the the site had a legend that if any if this code, these symbols were ever translated, it would change the world for good. Wow. But there were several symbols in there that I recognised, and we we, we pursued this. Um, and, and began to eventually decipher this message. And there was a link to the Grail and the Grail properties, and, and even there was even date here in, in old Cistercian ciphers, is this particular neural. So the, the book right. discovering more about the mysteries on that, and also it led us following these energy lines, and we'll just go to the, to the next one, to this slide, which was a chapel in the south of France. Again, this chapel was a, a, a Templar chapel built at the time of the height of the Templars in, in, in 1280. Um, AD and this uh, ceiling and hardly anyone knows about this chapel but the ceiling in this chapel had these all esoteric figures around and the walls again had similar sort of figures and no one had ever deciphered these things but as soon as we looked at them this was exactly like the, the changing shape that I showed you earlier at the node mm. you begin to see that you know flower of life here you can see the annulus region here, here like that the yeah annulus, which is the same as the containment field I've talked about which contained the vortex yeah and then you begin to see the vortex is appearing here in spirals. Yeah. It's a Templar sign here, which is basically a, a four a four petal per hour of life moving into that which is a single uh, torus moving into the double torus sign here. So there was a and, and again here you have this round castle shape. Yeah. Brick works in this castle shape uh, and round castles, but you find in the book Palestras with regards to the Templars. Um, searching for castles in the woods and, and each castle had a strange name like castle of joy or the, car, mm. or the turning castle or the unassailable castle and it was like uh, when you read the book per and just come off of that the castles were what they were all looking for and, and to overcome challenges at these castles uh, and this these became symbols or analogy for something which is uh, which i think now are the grails and the grail shapes at these energy, energy line intersections so it was they were saying that the 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 Templars, or this small group of Templars, uh, like the Knights, 
we're moving from one center of intersecting lines to another center yeah. of intersecting lines, trying to find their grail. Their yeah. To see whether the cup shape was it was forming at this place. But it was it was interesting more uh, because the the book the story Pelespas was written uh, and it was almost like the knights were learning to follow the synchronous path. The synchronous mm -hmm. it will be, you know, it will be sort of thing. You know, if God wills it, uh, it will happen. And they were learning to be a, a more spiritual knight in their on their journeys. Mm -hmm. And only once they achieved this spirituality, a level of spirituality, that they would then be able to see the grail or yeah. find the grail at the end. So there was a deep connection with uh, with earth energies as I saw it, and and, and the journey of life, uh, which was very similar to the cathars as well, and, and looking for the, the cathar path to being the perfect mm. person. So the book evolved a little bit from where the energy lines led us to finding about these mysteries and, and trying to solve these mysteries. And there was a third one, which was to do with uh, uh, a little book of Jewish alchemy that was uh, written just after. Mm. Um, the, the Templars were in Jerusalem about what the, the Templars discovered and how they discovered it. And, and that book of alchemy had two versions of, of hieroglyphic figures, one which was uh, the original and one which had been deliberately changed. And when you start looking at the two, you began to see the messages. Mm. Without giving the game away, what was quite amazing was you found that the, the, the huge numbers of snakes that were portrayed in these figures compared to anything else. And, and the snakes, of course, are synonymous with the energy, earth energy lines. But linking to these snakes were these rivers. And these rivers on these figures would run, would run into mounds or into trees, and they would have two-way two directions. Mm. So they couldn't possibly exist as, as water, because yeah. water doesn't do geographically. So they were highly symbolic of something which is a two-way stream, which is exactly what we find with energy lines. Yeah. The, the, the energy lines have a two-way direction because they're standing waves. Mm. They come back. Mm. So yeah. So <laughs> the energy lines are standing waves of sound and standing waves of electromagnetic uh, energies as well. So that, that's where the, the, the grail started and, and realizing that the, the, the small group of tempers got nearly all the way down to where they were looking for it, but they yeah. didn't find it in the end. Right. The reason why they didn't find it, we'll have to let you read the books for that. Yes, well, there's this book, The Grail Found, which people can get through your website as well as well as um, the, 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 the little book, The Guide. There's another one coming out, isn't there? Um, Grail sure. Bound. Yeah, Grail Bound is, is uh, more to do with the science behind uh, what's happening with regards to the energy lines yeah. and, and how, how these lines are produced and also the links to the Golden Prophecy and, and why we're going through these changes right now, what we can do. Yeah. Yeah, and also I just want to um, mention it quickly, and we'll we'll talk about this a lot more when we do talk again. But you um, are looking to do some Grail seminars to, to talk about this, and also something called the Grail Fitness Training. Well, we're looking at that, yes, as well, and we'll yeah. see how that evolves. But uh, we have to take people at the stage at the time. So the, the Grail yeah. Found seminars will probably be for people who read the book. Yeah. So, um, with, with the ability to to understand and then discuss and, and learn more. Yeah. Fitness seminars. Uh, that's going to evolve uh, probably now next year after the new energies have arrived. Yeah. It's an amount of amount of work we can do at a certain time. And the next really big part of work needs to be done is the location of these sep of these places where we have to meet, uh, so, yes. so people can, can meet on, on, on meditation. And, and connecting the grids together. So yeah. by the time we've, we've got onto those, we'll be next year. Yeah. So if people are wanting, you know, I've got people listening in and they're saying, oh, I want to be part of um, this. I want to meditate four yeah. times a year on one of them. And they're saying, but I don't know where. If they were to email you, would, would that be helpful? Or is there local dowsing groups or whatever they should contact? Because um, I've got people from all over the world listening in here. <laughs> Will be, there will be places, no, yeah. but just contact me uh, and I'll, I'll uh, there are ways of doing location checks where we can do, uh, we can work with finding out the energy lines near to you and repair nodes, that's one thing, but there will be more information as we go on. Okay. There will be a connecting site as well on, on World Harmony Trust, there's going to be a connecting page where we can, you can, you can promote them, your meditation and you can get other people to come to your site there and, uh, and, and, and and link up essentially it'd be a massive linking place that um, yeah 
we're, we're working on that. But to be honest, right now, if you just be on those on those the day before the solstice and the equinoxes, be somewhere special. Yeah. First, get okay. used to it, enjoy it. That will that will help you because the energies themselves will teach you. That's why the, the Gnostic yeah. gospel, the image of the snake was of the teacher, of the instructor, because you yeah. learn by these lines. And so you you go into these places at these times. You will learn what you need to learn. You'll be programmed by the energies to, to do what you're supposed to carry out. Yeah. You can't be prescriptive here from one. Yes. It's, it's an evolving thing where everybody's got a piece of the jigsaw. So. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> okay, so, so I'll make sure those two sites are, are, are up you. for people so that they can uh, they can have a look. But, wow. <laughs> well, thank you very much. All I can say is, wow, it's just amazing. Yeah, so there's so much there. And, and, I mean, there's so much more I know we can go into, but we've already... Um, gone over time oh, which oh. now is wonderful no no worries at all um rory it's been a delight uh, i i can't thank oh. you enough i really thank you, Sarah, very much appreciate it this so needs to go out into the world That's and, great. Good to help. <laughs> well thank you so much and to everyone who's listening um i hope you found that intriguing uh, as well as informative and please 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 go and check out rory's sites because this is so important for not just you and me but for everyone on this planet so until tomorrow until our next speaker thank you and goodbye <laughs>